In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Our gospel lesson is continuing with what may to you at this point seem like forever, the discourse in John's gospel about Jesus as the bread of life. We've been at this now for three weeks, and there's going to be two more weeks of it after this. I remember back when I was in seminary, my homiletics professor said about this section of the year B, he said, do not preach everything you know about bread on the first Sunday because you'll be in trouble for another month. But uh, anyway, what's happened here at this point is there's been a shift. Last week, Jesus was out in the streets of Capernaum and a crowd had gathered around him, the same crowd that had been fed miraculously in the wilderness from five loaves of bread and two fish. And they were chasing after him because they wanted more bread. And Jesus began to teach them that that there was a, a more important bread that they should be looking for rather than plain bread, but they should be seeking the bread that leads to eternal life. And then finally he says, it's me. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Now, what has happened in today's gospel is we've actually had a shift of scene, but John doesn't tell us that. In fact, we won't hear that he shifted the scene for another two weeks. But the scene here has shifted to the, to the uh, synagogue in Capernaum. And now he is being interrogated not by the crowd, but by the leaders of the synagogue. And they're, they, are, um, they are having a lot of trouble with this statement. He said that he came down from heaven and he is the living bread of life. And they're going, wait a second. Isn't this the son of Joseph? We, know jo- we knew Joseph. We know his parents. We know where he comes from. How can he say he came down from heaven. I mean, this is ridiculous, they're saying. Now, before we go, oh, those poor people, they should know better, that was probably a reasonable thing to think. In a large sense, for us today, we have an even harder time with this sort of thing than they did. Uh, One of um, C.S. Lewis's friends, a a, uh, philosopher named Owen Barfield, once said that literal thinking is the disease of the modern mind. And literally when we hear this, well, he's not literally bred. How could he be bred? How could he come down from heaven? We get all wrapped up in that. How could this have happened? Usually when we hear the idea of Jesus as the incarnation, which is a which sounds like a very technical uh, theological word, the incarnation of God. We, start, we immediately go back and start thinking about the virgin birth, and then we get worried about where did Jesus get the other half of his DNA, and it just goes, you know, it, it gets hard for us. Fortunately, English has a synonym for incarnation. Incarnation is a Latin word, which means, it means enfleshment. We have a synonym in English which means the same thing, and yet we don't tend to throw all the metaphysical and theological burdens on that word. That word is embody. When we say Jesus is the incarnation of the word of God, it sounds kind of strange. When we say Jesus in some way that we'll never fully understand because it's a mystery, Jesus has become the embodiment of the word of God. Now that we can kind of get a handle on. We don't know exactly how, but everything about God the Father, God's love, God's words, God's care, has become real in Jesus. It's he, in the way Jesus is, who he is, how he lives, how he relates to people, he is the very embodiment of God. And that's what he's saying, who he is. When he was questioned by the, the Jewish leaders and they, they said, you know, how can you do this? He said, no one has ever seen the Father except for me. But if you've seen the Father, if you, I mean, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. You know who God is. And he says, truly, I tell you, I am the bread of life. Now, they were com- comparing him to Moses, right? 
Moses, we know who Moses was. Moses fed all the people in the wilderness and with manna. And Jesus said, first last week, he said, no, God fed them with manna. Moses was just there. But then the other thing he said was, that whole generation of people who ate the manna in the wilderness died and never made it to the Holy Land. Remember, they wandered for 40 years. So that the generation that came out of Egypt was dead before, the, before they came into the promised land. Jesus says, the manna was not the bread that leads to eternal life. I am. So we get a much deeper thing. Now, how is Jesus the bread of life, and how do we approach and appropriate that bread in our lives? That's the big question for us. Well, what Jesus suggests is that we will find him in our life together in the church. We will find him, he says, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And he goes on to say those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will live forever. By the time he gets to say that, although it sounds really weird, he's really talking about the life of the church, the sacramental life that we live together. It is within this body of Christ that we still find him today. It's not by accident that the the early apostles kept referring to the church as the body of Christ. We the people who are here are now together corporately. We are Christ in the world to each other and to the world. And it's in, in all of our imperfection that is still who we are. That as we live into God's promises in Jesus, we are able more and more to grow into who Jesus is. Dale, today you'll be baptized into this body of Christ, into this church. And the bapti- your baptism day is not the end of a process. It's really much closer to the beginning. Because with your baptism, you now can fully enter into all of the life of God in the church, in Christ, here. This is the beginning of, as you, as you do this, you'll more and more be able then to live into God's promises. Paul knew, we heard in the epistle to the Ephesians, Paul knew that people in the church would still not be perfect, but they could still be the embodiment of Christ. And what we still need to do is keep working on it. It's why he said, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It is in living together that we... Find Christ still present among us, who we still seek. So this is a wonderful occasion for us to celebrate our life together, but it's also an occasion to remember that when we're doing it, Christ is present with us in a very powerful and real way. We are the body of Christ. We partake the bread of life in communion, and we become the bread of life for each other and for the world. Amen.